Welcome everyone, wherever you are. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to this uh, webinar organized by EDCTP and uh, CTI Life Health. The purpose of uh, this webinar is already described in the note, invitation note that everyone uh, received. And it's nice to see you. I see from the participants list, we have uh, colleagues from networks of excellence um, and other areas. Welcome. From my side, I'm with Michelle Ndev from EDCTP. Well, Michelle, maybe you can just uh, wave to the audience. Um, there may not be time for everyone to introduce themselves. Um, yeah, so let me kick off by saying a few words about EDCTP and how we come together with CTI Life Health. So EDCTP, as you know, is an organization which is public public funder for clinical research happening in Sub-Saharan Africa, but geared to develop interventions against infectious diseases that mainly affect the poor in the world. And this program started in 2003 with emphasis on developing vaccines, drugs, microbicides, and diagnostics against TB, HIV, and malaria. And uh, for those of you who remember, it was a small grant from the European Commission bringing together European member states and African member states with 400 million euros. And after 10 years of a successful implementation of the experiment, we got bigger grant of 1.3 billion euros for another 10 years. And with a mandate to include other infections that are described as neglected infectious diseases by WHO. And now we have a whole portfolio that we have been working on for the last 10 years, funding clinical research, capacity development, networking, and advocacy, et cetera, et cetera in Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, which will continue up to 2024. And we are lucky that from 2022 last year, the European Union and Africa Union agreed to continue this program for the another 10 years to 2031, with uh, another bigger grant of 1.6 billion euros. And um, this also goes to the same areas of focus but also including other emergencies like we know nowadays, in fact, um, the, uh, the epidemics uh, of um, pandemic potential like COVID. Um, in, in the past, of course, we had Ebola. Um, and yeah, yeah. So um, in our work, um, especially us from the Africa office, we are very serious about building research capacity in Sub-Saharan Africa so that Sub-Saharan Africa first becomes a very strong active participant in uh, the war against uh, infectious diseases by building its capacities to the levels of those that are in Europe or America, all close to that, so that uh, there's a, a, a leveled playing field, but also to help Africa to build its own platforms for future conduct of clinical research. As you see from the global epidemiology, um, Africa is not spared from all our menaces of health, including now non-communicable diseases that WHO says they will surpass the infectious disease by 2030. And hopefully maybe we don't reach there because we have enough problems, but that's where we are. We need to build um, very strong research capacities. Our digital technologies, as the world is changing and digital technologies are making life much easier in all aspects of R and D, it so happens that in clinical research in Sub-Saharan Africa, this is the area that lags behind so badly compared to other WHO regions. So the number of cell phones people have have increased up to the village level. My grandma has some old, uh, you know, phone uh, which she uses. 
which was never the case 10 years ago. But at the hospital level, the way patients are managed is all paper-based. And the way records are kept is all degradable paper-based, paper such that conduct of clinical research based on good epidemiological data that is well stored, secure, and is visible to those who want it at the touch of a button is not yet here in Africa. And EDCTP is, because of the way it is engaging in this business, is very interested to have this type of advances. So what the, in the world where we help build capacities for ethics committees, regulated agencies, we have supported programs that have developed softwares, which these committees have adopted and are using here and there in Africa. One of which is called Rhino Ethics, <coughs> uh, which was developed by scientists, Corey, but the scientists were Brazilian, but now it's sold to many ethics committees that need it. Basically to change from this fire hazard, degradable way of keeping data, but also to give the committees efficiency so that they can do their work very quickly, just like um, journals that publish our articles do by reviewing things online very quickly. As I say, in terms of storing hospital data, or collecting it and storing it for research sites, this is a different story. So this is the first uh, best and rationale why CTI becomes an, uh, an important partner to EDCTP. So Michael uh, introduced uh, CTI to us, we listened to what he said, he said, well, we don't do the research, but you need to talk to the people who do the research, we can facilitate um this uh process and that's from the edcp side but let me talk also from the global side so for those of you who know last year in may at the world health assembly the world health assembly called for increased coordination collaboration and strengthening of the global clinical research ecosystem, they call it ecosystem. Why? Because when they look back at the trials done through COVID, during COVID, the FDA in the US had this data that was published in Nature that showed that 95% of the trials were firstly badly designed and they couldn't answer the same question they were designed to. In other words, all the money we spent, billions we spent in these clinical trials, looking at chloroquine and all these other stuff, was money down the drain. That's the question is how can we do things better? The second finding is that most of our research was done in developed countries. So Africa, for example, is treated as underrepresented continent. In that, in that arena. But yet there was uh, a lot of um, products that flowed and I myself was vaccinated three times through a Pfizer uh, COVID uh, vaccine uh, that was not piloted and well, well tested in, in Africa. So for that reason, WHO have now also formed um, a process, a committee that is looking at implementing this World Health Assembly Resolution 75.8. And I tend to be one of the privileged 15 people in the world that are sitting on this committee since last month. And um, we are really, these are some of the things we will be looking at to see how does Africa embrace this kind of technology boost and what are the challenges, what are the bottlenecks, and where are the areas that need really good focus. And, and so this kind of discussion for us, or for me, if I can take off my DCP hat and put on the WHO hat, it comes at the right time. So um, having said that, um, I think it's time that we should hear from uh, 
CTI Life Health. And according to our program, uh, we start with you, Michael, Michael Landu, who is going to kick off with the first presentation before we come to Michelle. And then Sam and uh, his team from Uganda will give us the some feel from uh, the test case from the ground. Um, and then the colleagues are here also from uh, from the, the digital technology um, uh, house, uh, like uh, Ron, Ron Emerson there and uh, John Emerson that could also talk to us. So I think in principle for uh, all the protocols are being observed because this is a, a Zoom meeting. And I think people who have got questions, please feel free to type in the chat for clarifications. And Michelle Onderu uh, or Michelle Barry will help us to filter these so that we can address them as we go along. If I'm not mistaken, we have two hours and uh, we may take a break in the middle and uh, restart again to make it a little bit comfortable for everyone, if I may propose that. Okay. So, Michael, over to you. I'm actually going to steal the stage. <laughs> I, I'd love to introduce Michael in just a moment, but I'm going to start, if you don't mind, Dr. Naranda, thank you for those inspiring opening remarks and for introducing CTI to the world of clinical research in Africa. It's a wonderful honor to be here. Um, my name is Michelle Berry, and I'm the CEO of CTI Life Health. We are a patient-centric, meaning we're patient-first, very comprehensive digital primary health care ecosystem. Uh, our platform empowers all of the key stakeholders in the global and public health arena with a focus on emerging nations. As Dr. Narenda was, I think, teeing up for us beautifully, you know, we're all aware of the crucial role that clinical research plays in the development of effective healthcare interventions and treatments and how important it is to ensure that the studies are conducted in a safe, ethical, and transparent manner. However, for many developing countries, as you probably know, clinical research has been a difficult um, and challenging and complex process with a number of different barriers to access, to trust, to engagement. So today, what we want to explore with you is how our platform, Life Health, is helping transform the landscape of clinical research in developing countries and how we can collaborate with organizations like EDCTP to find ways to overcome the challenges. By leveraging some of the digital tools and platforms, woo, a little bit of a feedback there. Sorry. Sure. Oh, okay. Was it me? Is it something else? <laughs> I can stop and there we go. I think we're good now. Uh, by leveraging some of these tools, um, what we believe is that we can help build the trust back up and build accountability measures in and create also a more inclusive and equitable clinical trial for the patients and, and the entire ecosystem. Um, we have a really distinguished panel of speakers for you today, and they will be sharing their insights and experiences in this area. And we hope that the webinar will inspire and inform each of us who are here on the webinar today. Um, we will be doing a Q&A session following the presentations. Michelle and I will, will tag team on that and make sure that your questions are there. So please feel free to drop your questions in through the chat or the Q&A box, and we'll make sure we keep an eye on that. We may hold that till the end. Um, but now I would love to introduce our first panelist, Mr. Michael Landau, who is our founder and executive chairman of CTI Life Health. Michael has been deploying digital solutions in Africa for more than 20 years. He's been on the continent for quite some time, working with uh, the very first mobile banking platform on the continent, possibly in the world. Um, Michael drives our vision. He's a very visionary person, as you'll see here in the next few minutes. He's built a global network of connections all across governments, international institutions like World Bank, European, European Union, DBSA, among many others. He's also on the Strategy Council of the United Nations Global Alliance for ICT and Development, and he's also a member of the UN Global Impact and UN Office of Partnership. So you are in for an innovation treat today as Michael takes you through the Life Health platform. Ladies and gentlemen, Michael Landau, it's all yours, Michael. Thank you very much, Michelle. Um, it's really, it's an honor and a pleasure to be here. 
Um, I'd like to start by thanking you know, Dr. Tom Nurenda for giving us this really wonderful opportunity. It's a, it's a great honor and a pleasure, and it's enhanced my life being able to get to know you and your vision and your mission, both as EDCTP and the WHO and your passion for tuberculosis and just your passion for helping people in general. Uh, Michelle, thank you for that wonderful introduction. Thank you, uh, Michelle Nderu, for, for helping organize and arrange everything today. And I'd like to thank, you know, on our panelists today, our couple of our partners, Ron Emerson, from who's the, who was running till recently the uh, Global Health at Zoom, and Dr. David Wambi, who is running the hospital, which I'll mention later about where we're doing our initial pilot. So allow me to please uh, share my screen. Um, and we'll... You know, I've been allotted a fair amount of time. The, the program that we've built um, is quite comprehensive and literally takes several hours to go through all the different facets and the features that we have available. Um, I'm going to try and do this much, much, much faster. Uh, we, uh, we will have the, uh, the, the, the slides, the deck available for anybody who would like to, to see it and watch it again. And, and of course, we'll all be available over, the, over time to meet with you in person. And we look forward to really developing some very strong collaborations with the EDCTP world and the world of clinical trials and the world of universal healthcare and primary healthcare in general. So allow me, so we, I've, we've titled this presentation, Democratizing Clinical Trials, because we feel that the, with using technology, we can make clinical trials a lot more accessible uh, to the, um, so, and that we've, what we've put of it, so we've CTIs developed and deployed a patient-centric, as Michelle said, a comprehensive digital universal healthcare ecosystem that empowers all the key stakeholders in the public health sector and with an initial focus in Africa. And then on this slide, we've got a couple of quotes from, from some of our partners uh, talking about our program. So as we discuss the, the, uh, the challenges for clinical trials in the developing world, there are four key areas which we've identified, and again, with lots of discussion that we've identified that make it a little bit more challenging to run clinical trials, um, and in our case, in Africa, versus doing it in you know, the United States or in, in Europe. So number one is the data integrity. Where's the data coming from? Where are the results coming from? How do we make sure that the, the information is actually correct, that it came from the exact places that it was supposed to come from? And then the next problem is how do you recruit quality patients? It can take you know, a long time till you identify kind of the right patient with the right set of diseases, because we, it's very difficult to actually have access to the proper patient records to be able to determine uh, who they are. And the next thing is that once you do do a recruitment, it's very difficult to track the recruits and, um, and to be able to verify that the results of what it is you're trying to track are actually verifiable. And then the third element is that is, is being able to stay in touch with the patients when you're looking to do the pharmacovigilance or you're looking just within the trial itself to ensure, you know, how the patients, how they're feeling and the interaction with the patients. So those is what, we, you know, and discussion that we've identified as the, some of the key challenges. So what we've done is in the Life Health Solution, uh, as we look at each of the, the, uh, the, the challenges, um, as the presentation goes along, we're going to show you how the Life Health Solution goes and attacks each of these core integral challenges. So with regards to data integrity, we're gonna show you how our solution can verify all the facilities, the investigators and, and the recruits, and it creates a verified chain of events for all the actionable results. As it relates to the difficulty to recruit quality patients, so we're gonna show you kind of within our infrastructure, how our platform can work to help you and help, and we, because we have a huge potential for large numbers of recruits with no medical histories, organic and live medical data. And Life Health also has the ability to contact and, and get consent from identified recruits. And again, we're gonna go into more detail as the presentation goes along. As it relates to the difficulty to track recruits and, and to verify results, We've got within our solutions, uh, all actions can be tracked digitally from drug taking to the location of the action of the that was being verified. So we have the ability to track and to trace and to verify. And with regard to the patient engagement, we have the Life Health as a unique interactive patient engagement process that can track, verify, and engage the recruits as per the agreed protocol. So you would, whichever, whichever clinical trial we're working on, whatever the questions are, whatever the frequency is, and the type of questions and the type of interactions and knowledge that are going to be needed, will our solution will be able to handle that. So we have a slide over here. I'm not going to read this. Just gives you like a bit of a high level. And our the Life Health platform is broken down into a digital healthcare infrastructure, which is both a web 
and a mobile-based um, infrastructure. We use a lot of artificial intelligence, machine learning, and technology to be able to do analytics on the data. And of course, we're designed to be able to have, because we're, we're pleased our platform will ha has a lot of data, as I'll show you, there's a lot of opportunity on our platform to do the research and development. There are a lot of benefits of the general life health proposition. It's designed as a platform for universal healthcare, for primary healthcare, and it's designed for governments and large scale institutions to be able to empower their patients and to be able to improve the efficiency of primary healthcare provision, as well as create tremendous value for the healthcare part providers. It's, it creates a lot of cost savings, a lot of efficiencies, a lot of empowerment, and there's also the, the ability to do research and development. Here are just a few screenshots of the uh, of the health wallet, and we have different health wallets. We have a health wallet for the patient, a health wallet for the health workers, but we make it really easy for the patient to be able to have complete access to all of their medical records. We've got solutions for blood typing and to be able to keep a record of the blood typing. We've got medical history. We've got vaccine records. We've got, we, we even, we provide permissions for the patients to give permission to specific doctors and hospitals to allow them to see their records. And then we also have the ability for the patient to revoke the permission, right? We've got the ability to go and take pictures and restore the pictures in the system, have a complete history of medical records. Our telemedicine includes symptom checkers and we've got avatars that the patients can go and click. So it makes it really easy for the patients to join, for health workers to be able to go and report and record. And then we also have a very unique QR code. We have a smart QR code system. And this QR code system, depending on who's reading the QR code, will be able to identify the patient as if it's a doctor, they'll be able to see medical records if they have permission. If it's a pharmacy, they'll be able to see kind of the latest uh, prescription. If it's a if it's a, uh, a laboratory, they'll be able to see the latest prescription for, for lab work. And then if they are part of a clinical trial, the QR code will, will instruct the, the investigator to do whatever it is that's needed. So that's one of our very cool features. And as you can see, we keep very, very, you know, very good digital records. You know, you've got all the graphs, the historical, we've got all the vital signs. So we've got a very comprehensive solution. We've, we, one of the things that we've done is we, we like to use uh, cartoons and comic strips and to make it easy for people to understand. And when we were, we've got a partnership with the Ministry of Health in Uganda. And so when we launched our, our collaboration with them on COVID, we, we produced a, a very famous uh, uh, cartoon. It was called the Katoto cartoon with the Ministry of Health. And then when the Ministry of Health wanted to do a, a campaign for malaria nets, we created a series of three cartoons for that. It's available on our website, but you'll see that we're very creative in the way that we do patient interaction and the way we explain things to people. So over here, it's a nice little story. You know, kind of uh, the husband comes in, he finds his wife in bed. I feel so weak. Oh my goodness, you've got terrible fever, she says. And then let me register you on the Life Health platform so that we can talk to a doctor. So we do the registration. Hello, doctor. They're now doing the telemedicine. And then doctor, as you can see, my wife is very weak. She has fever and lost her appetite. What can we do about this? Well, it says, you know, I've arranged for a nurse to come over to you and do a blood test. And after that, we can then make a prescription. So here you go on the next one. The, the nurse comes along. Here's my wife. Take, my, take a sample. The nurse takes the sample, puts it into the laboratory machine. And we've got our software is able to take the results of the bloods. And within our network, the results actually go directly into the health wallet. Right? They don't go to the doctor first, the doctor gets a copy, but it literally goes directly into the health wallet. And then we've got analytics within our health wallet that will be able to alert the patient and alert the, the health professional, you know, what's wrong you know, with the patient based on the results. So here we've got, oh, wow, I've received the test results directly into my health, my health wallet. That was quick. Uh, it says here, my wife has malaria, positive for malaria. They do the telemedicine call, get back, back on with the doctor, and the doctor there goes and orders some a prescription for the patient. But that's in a little, in a little cute comic, in the nutshell of how powerful our platform is. So when it comes now to the solution for the clinical trials, we've created a concept that we call Trim, and the idea of Trim is to attack all core areas of the clinical trial process. So the number one is trust and track and trace. So it's this is the idea of evidence of data collection with direct access to the recruited patients in real time. 
with a unique tool to uh, data collection tools. And I'm going to show that to you in a moment. The next phase is going to be the recruitment. How do we recruit good patients? And then the next stage is the investigation and the intervention. Once already you've got, you've recruited, you need to be able to follow them for six months, a year or two years or five years. It just depends on the, the nature of the clinical trial that is being done. So we'll show you how our tools are able to go and support that act action. And then once the, once the uh, patient is ready included into the system, then it's a question, and then, or you've got the pharmacovigilance. So now you've got drugs, you know, as Dr. Narendra was talking about before, well, you know, you've got the Pfizer COVID drug, which was, you know, all the people that were tested were primarily Caucasians, even in 2020, there was primarily Caucasians in, in, in America uh, that were tested on the Pfizer drug. So we've, you, but yet you've got loads of drugs that the pharmaceutical companies are, whether it's Tylenol or, or, or the Pfizer drug that you want to be able to do the pharmacovigilance and be able to track the, the efficacy kind of, of those drugs. So we're going to show you how our platform will be able to handle that also. So here we're going to talk first about the trust and tracking and transparency. So here we've created one slide, you know, and on the slide over here, we show you kind of how we do the digitization, the mapping and the tracking. And then over here, we've got a little video that is linking you to uh, more detail, but I'm going to now go and give you a little uh, give a little show of how our system works. So I'm going to leave the PowerPoint for a second. And now we're going to go into the uh, the data. So as you see, we collect, we've got the capacity to collect a lot of data. Now we can't show you real patients data. So we've created a little, um, a, an Excel spreadsheet with synthetic data of a fake group of 300 people in an area in, in Uganda. They're based on real people, but they're not real people. And it's not and it's not possible to understand who these people are. But as you see from here, you see we, we collect their, we obviously kind of their name, their background, their phone number, their email address, and then we collect their, their location. So we, we, we know exactly where they are. We don't share that information, but in the event of an outbreak and you need to know exactly where somebody is, the government will have the ability to go and identify where the outbreak has taken place. And not only that, they'll be able to know who else lives within depending on what they need to know, within 100 feet, within 100 meters, within a mile. Um, then within the, the way we collect data on the app, we, we collect data on mental health, on sickle cell, sickle cell carrier, do you have a disability? Very importantly, we collect information on, do you agree to be a blood donor? Do you agree to be an organ donor? Do you agree to be part of a clinical trial? And then we start going into the area of the vitals. So we've got blood pressure. And as you see here, we've already got all the different analytics that will be able to start telling our system if the numbers are normal, if they're not normal. We collect information about visual hip problems, hearing problems, your diabetes. Have you got malaria? Have you had malaria? So, and then we do the CBC information, lipid profile, liver function, all the different core uh, medical data. And this is all information that we do, we, we collect within our system because we are providing people with medical healthcare. So the system the information is in the system. Everything that we do, as, as far as, you know, just to talk about the, the, the elephant in every room and every discussion, you know, kind of we, we work with a company called MedStack. We have the absolute highest levels of security and HIPAA compliance and, and compliance within all the various regulations. And also we will uh, data all that we follow the rules in every single country and data is, is we, we want the data to be owned by the people themselves. And that's why we create permission systems that the patient gives permission for a doctor to see their records and they can actually revoke the permission. So that's how we do with the data. And we want the patients to actually own their own data. We only use the data with consent of the patient. So here you've got over here with the vaccine, what they've been vaccinated for or not. So over here, this is where we start. We're able to visualize the data of the patient. So here we've got this fictitious synthetic 300 people. And so within these 300 people, so we collect a lot of data there, you know, who's got malaria, the blood grouping of the patients, right? You've got, you know, kind of the, the breakdown, male, female, you, who's got mental health problems. You've got all the data, we're able to visualize it. So uh, imagine now we do, we're, we're looking to do to recruit for a trial, and let's say it's a unique trial, and we want to do, it. Say so first, if we want to recruit for a trial, the first thing we have to do is identify who's agreed to be part of a trial. So let's say, okay, so yes, we've, so we've got 225 people have agreed to be part of the trial. Well, what age category is this particular trial for? So we can narrow it down. So let's say it's between people ages 17 to, six to 65, right? 
So 17 to 65, so we have 181 people that we can be collecting data from. So now let's say we want, this is a very unique drug and it's a drug for HIV. So, okay, let's see. So we need the people who've got HIV. So, okay, so we're down to 28 people. And let's say it's a drug for people with HIV and it's actually kind of a diabetes drug, but, and we wanna see the correlation for people with diabetes and with, uh, and with HIV. So we click on the diabetes button and we've now identified it and we brought it down to the 12 people. And now we're able to go, and let's say within this trial, what we're really looking for is we want to have, you know, kind of uh, three males, three females. So we're able now to go and send out an email to those people or call them and say, would you like to be part of the clinical trial? You've been identified as being somebody that qualifies. And now, so within an hour or two, you know, we'll be able to go and offer these people what they want to join the trial and they can accept and this is a process that, as you guys are all familiar with, this is what you do. Um, this can take a year, a year and a half, but within our system, and you know, in our system, our data is collected. I'll show you with who and how, but we have Dr. David Wambi, you know, with our hospital partner, St. Charles. So we've already got some close to 30,000 people on our platform through his hospital. They're all verified. They know who they are. And we've got all their medical history. And then as we expand and expand, so we know that the data is coming from verified sources. This is, uh, so this is, a, we believe, a very powerful tool for the, for the recruitment process. Whilst we're here, though, I'd like to just go and share with you a little bit more about the power of our system. So the, the way we've built our system is we, we've got tools that we can go and create data collection and data visualization. This particular tool over here, and then we use what we call level one and level two data. This particular tool over here was designed for the Bowikwe District Health Office of, in Uganda. And over here, so what we've identified to them is all 47 hospital facilities. And then we collect a lot of data. How many beds are there? How many radiation departments? How many laboratory departments? How many ambulances? How many people have got optical solutions? How many have got dental? And then how many are open? 24 hours and how many are open only during the day? How many are eight different levels of hospitals? So, and then we can go and click down. So let's say we're looking for a, a specific type. We only want to work with a hospital. So we click the hospitals and we've identified the four hospitals and they'll have, you know, let's say that we don't want to make sure they do surgery because it's a special program for surgery, right? So we go and we identify, okay, there are three hospitals and do they all, um, and it's a surgery, eye surgery. So actually there's only one hospital that does eye surgery and we can actually go and drill right down into that hospital of Kualo. And then we'll be able to go and click and get, you know, kind of all the data that we need on the Kualo hospital, et cetera. Now, another feature that we've got and built so over here, you'll be able to see all the information about the Kualo hospital. And then within the system over here, we've gone and built the ability, we call it Life Connect. And so over here, let's say now the district health officer um, of Bowikwe wants to have a meeting with uh, the all the people who run his, uh, you know, the, they run the different departments. And I imagine this is within your world. You've now got a clinical trial going and you've identified two or three or 20 or 40 different facilities that are all working within your system. So now you want to go and have a meeting. You want to have a meeting of the people who run them, the child maternity and the laboratory services. You can click and send a Zoom invite, click. It'll take seconds, right? You want to send them an email. You want to do an SMS broadcast. And then what we've done over here, some of you will be familiar with UNASO in Uganda. So this is not real data. This is also kind of just a synthetic data set that we put together for UNASO. Um, but, and this is now from an organizational perspective. So they now need to know how many organizations belong to, you know, kind of a work within, within UNASO. So you see 186. How many of them, let's say you want to know how many are registered officially. So there's 40. So uh, 46 percent, 49 of them are officially registered, um, et cetera. And then you want to know all the information. Do they have Wi-Fi? Do they have electricity? You know, do they have diseases, services? What services they serve, suffer? So we're, very, we're able then over here, we're able to go and collect what we call the level two data, which I forgot to show you on the first slide. You've got the level two data, which is where you've got daily, weekly data coming in. And therefore, we're able to instantly start showing, you know, are the indicators working or not working? You know, kind of are things going well or not? And then from here, you can then go and zoom into a particular county. So let's say you want to go and do Ginger and Albertong. You want to go and check on these two uh, villages, these two kind of uh, districts, right? 
uh, well, so it looks like we don't have, uh, let's say, Mukano. Let's go now that, see if there's any facilities in Mukano. And Miyunga said, hey, you do have some facilities in Mukano. And now you'll be able to see, okay, how many facilities are there? So you're able to zoom in, zoom out, and have all this information at the click of the fingertips. So whether it's the medical information on the individual, whether it's on, you know, kind of the, the, the hospital facilities. And over here, this is where we show the, the, uh, the, the data on, a, on a, an instant basis. Okay, so let's just move on from here. Let's go back to the, to, the, to the presentation. So that's how we do the trust and the tracking. Now let's move on to, to, the, to the recruitment. So over here, so being recruited for clinical trials. So again, we want to make it really easy for the people who are, who are watching, the people who we're bringing the recruits on. So here you've got the young girl. Ouch, my back hurts. Wow, I'm approved to join a clinical trial. And then she connects to the Life Health Center, which would be one of your centers. Welcome, you're going to take this medicine three times a day. We, you'll need to scan the medicine each time you take it. So within our system, we've got the ability for the patient to scan. Now we put the barcode on the medicine, it would be on the box. Right, so you scan, so she asked, do I, so I scan the medicine first, three days later, good morning, and now we're asking the questions, are you feeling dizzy, fatigued, right, well, I don't feel any pain anymore, so here you see, you know, kind of what she's recruited, how the system can work really easily, and obviously we would tailor make the system to whichever, whichever program it is you're working, so then when we're actually running a clinical trial, so over here, again, there's another video, you'll be able to see a lot more on the, on the, on the, the detail, more details on the video, so here you've got, how do we run a clinical trial, so Dr. Mina, my wife has an illness, my doctor says she can try a new pill in a study. Well, and then he says, well, why would my wife want to be a guinea pig? Well, we only know if the pill works if we do first do trials. So every pill has gone through trials. Yes. And people volunteer to be treated in these trials. So trials are a good thing. Yes. So the wife says, yes, I will volunteer. Because now we've been able to explain to the people in a nice, simple way why it is we need to do trials and why should they should join the trial. Now, what about the risks and how do we get consent? So again, my wife has an illness, you know, she, she could join a trial, but there may be side effects. So the, so the doctor explains, they've already done some trials on this pill to check for side effects. So now all we're looking to see is how well it works. And they will ask your wife all sorts of questions to see if she gets side effects. So, they, so the wife says, so they'll want me to tell them if I don't feel well? Yes, right? So a trial is a safe way to take a pill. Yes, so what we've created over here is a nice, simple, easy way for you guys to be able to go and, and onboard and recruit and explain to people the, the process of a trial. Now, once we've started the trial itself with the investigation, within our tools, we can again, we can be tracking the patients, we can know their medical history, we can be tracking all of their information, what their blood type, whatever information it is that you need to be taking, uh, collecting, and we're able to go and interact, and you'll be able to go and do telemedicine, you know, and how to be able to speak to the people, you'll be able to send messages to the patients to be able to say, okay, did you, how, are you responding well or not? And we've built in all of these features already within our infrastructure. The next is the pharmacovigilance and the monitoring. So now drugs are out there in the market. So we've got the ability to work with you, with pharma, to be able to say, okay, is our drug working? Is it not working? And we can follow up. We'll know which patients have been given which drugs. We can work with you to actually focus with a particular drug that you guys might have. And then you'll create a questionnaire. You'll be able to see how often a patient needs to be needs to call in, when do they need to be able to go and provide the information. So again, we've got another YouTube video over here that will go through it in more detail. And then over here, we've got the CTI platform for telemedicine, which is uh, Ron Emerson, you know, from, from formerly of Zoom, who's head of Zoom Healthcare. Hopefully he'll be confirming to you later on that this is one of the best telemedicine systems that are out there. So you'll be able to have your patients call in to your investigators and your investigators are going to have the complete info record and information instantly available to them. So just to talk a little bit about our collaborations and our partnership and, and our pilot that we're doing in Uganda, we're going to hear soon from Dr. David Wambi, who's going to give a little bit more of an overview on, on the relationship that we have with him. And Michelle will, you know, kind of will, will, will introduce him. But what we've done in Buikwe is we've, we've created a little bit of a, a, a try, a, we've triangulated uh, the core of what we believe is needed for a for our core business, which is rolling out primary healthcare, universal healthcare. So we've identified we have a partnership with the UCMB, the Uganda Catholic Medical Bureau. They've got 370 facilities around Uganda. They have 3 million patients a year. They have 10 million patients that they've seen over the last 
few years. And we worked with them. We said, okay, let's identify the, uh, the, the, a great hospital to be able to work with. So, and then we also have partnership with the Buikwe district. So the district health us of Buikwe, where we showed you the screen before with their 47 health facilities over there. And we asked them, which is the best hospital for us to partner with? So the St. Charles Luero Buikwe Hospital is in Buikwe. It's a rural, it's a hospital set in a rural environment. They have 90 beds. It's got pretty much, as you saw before, pretty much all the services available. And it's a and it's a and they're a phenomenal group of people. So our team are embedded in the hospital as we're working with them to do a complete integration since we started. Um, and then in addition to that, we've now created a partnership with MTN. They're going to be supporting our initiatives that we're doing not only in Bowikwe, hopefully kind of beyond. And they've obviously got a reach in many of the countries that you are all representing here today. So the, the Boikwe project itself, so some of the key facts, so we started the project in January 2023, a few months ago. The number of patients that we have enrolled in our system, we have already over 29,000 people enrolled. We have an extra 15 plus people a day. And then we've got you know, the number of health workers that are now on the digital platform. And we've got the village health teams and we're working together with the hospital, with the district, with the village health teams, training them how to be in the village, how to onboard people, how to do telemedicine from the village. So it's very, very comprehensive. So it's, it gives a very wide ability for you to be able to go and run clinical trials you know, kind of in the very, very, even in the most rural areas of value addition, you know, we've got identifiable, traceable patients, high quality pinpoint patient follow up. And then we've got, so with our partnership alone, you know, within the Buikwe, we've got the ability to have 55, some 500,000 patients uh, and clients within our system within a short period of time. And then with the UCMB, as we go, please God, start expanding with them. They've got 3 million patients a year. They see 10 million patients they've seen over the last three, four unique patients over the last four or five years. So within the work that we've got in Uganda, we've got a phenomenal capacity. But our core system is really designed to empower you. And in your country, wherever it is you're doing, our platform will be there to go and support you. A little bit about the leadership in our, in our company. And thank you very, very much. Michelle, I'm going to pass it back to you. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Michael. I really appreciate the fantastic presentation. And I would like to invite um, Dr. David Wambi to speak a little bit about the pilot since we were just speaking on that note and just give us a little perspective on what he's seeing uh, at the hospital at St. Charles in Bewickwe. Yes, thank you, Michelle, and thank you, Michael. Uh, you can all hear me? Yes, okay. So I am Dr. David Silva Wambi, and I am the medical director and CEO of St. Charles Luanga Buiko Hospital. Uh, we are located in the first central of the country. We have a capacity of 90 beds and about 13 departments. We do uh, general surgery, internal medicine, pediatrics, and child health, obstetrics, we pharmacy, and a lot of community activities. Uh, we have partnered with CTI uh, since January 2021. And uh, I wish to say that I am really, really excited for this partnership because uh, the CTI Life Health Program is a, a fully pledged uh, system. It integrates a lot of parameters. That's uh, healthcare. It integrates patient follow-up. It integrates a lot of prevention and interventional techniques in healthcare. It also integrates research and at the same time, you are able to do internal system strengthening by just using this app. So it's a very, very good innovation and I find it a blessing to have it here. And uh, I want to assure you that uh, if all goes well, um, this program will actually transform healthcare, transform research in Africa and within Uganda as a country. I have found the, the CTI program very, very important to me as a hospital because uh, now, first and foremost, it's able to generate for me a good database, putting aside the, the, the paper system that has been running. So this database helps me to capture patient information in real time, right from the time the patient steps into the hospital, through the different service points and to the exit point. The conventional system stops there. However, with this life health program, I am able to follow the patient into the community without me going to the community. 
So I am able to follow the patient into the community and the patient is able to, 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 to revert back to me at any time they need. So the system can also help mitigate unnecessary patient delays as they walk through different service points. And also not forgetting the bit of confidentiality. There is no one single point patient records will leak. Probably has misplaced a patient chart, a book, a file, or a paper. Never. So at all points, the patient is confident that their information is in under good custody. And then the CTI Life Health Program has helped to empower patients to take charge of their own health. It has promoted a lot of self-care to patients because uh, the patient has their information and biodata in their phone. So at any one point, the patient is able to know how they stand and how they do. And in case they need to seek health intervention, they're able to make a decision right on time. They don't have to wait for pain or wait for any complication to come in. And then with the uh, availability of the telemedication app, it has made a healthcare service delivery very easy to the hospitals, to me as a facility, and then to my patients. It's now easier for the patient to reach the hospital. Previously, uh, the patient has to incur transport costs to move from wherever they are to look for a hospital, to look for a healthcare provider, which is not as easy as it sounds in Africa. Our healthcare patient ratio is too, too, too wide. It's one to a thousand doctor patient ratio. But with the evolution of the telemedicine app in the CTI Life Health Program, the patient finds it easy to access a professional service from a healthcare provider at just a, 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 at the comfort of their room through a phone call. So I have my team of doctors, my nursing team that are enrolled onto the life health application to listen to patient concerns. And uh, this has uh, improved health seeking behavior. It has uh, reduced on disease burden. And then also it is reducing on the cost of service delivery within Africa and a rural setting or Uganda at large. Because uh, previously the patient has to walk to the hospital, pay consultation, pay lab fees, even for things that are not necessary. However, the patient is able to mitigate all of those unnecessary expenditures through a mere phone call. And then it also clears the, 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 the propaganda and uh, the misconcepts uh, between the community because uh, given our doctor-patient ratio, patients cannot easily access a doctor in the community, which leaves them to the leverage of consulting brothers, sisters, parents, uh, friends who are not medical, and so they mislead them. So with, with the evolution of this application, all that is, has been able to come to an end because the patient knows when I have a problem, I have Dr. David in Buyuko Hospital, and, and through this app, I can get him regardless of the time of the day. So overall, you realize our health, the patient's concerns, patient challenges, and uh, access to health care has become easy. And then the other bit is that in Africa, there has been a very, very poor uptake of clinical research. And uh, my mentioned some of the challenges, but the biggest challenge to clinical research in Africa is the data. With our paper systems, it becomes so cumbersome for you to go retrospect and have the data to justify a problem. By the time you notice there's a problem, it has already hit hard and interventions cannot come in to, to prevent uh, uh, the, the, the worsening problem. The CTI Life Health Program has mitigated this cause with a database, you have the info, all the patient data for a month, for a week, you can have for a year, just a click of a button. So it, this really makes a very excellent problem analysis for a region. And you're able to, to map disease, to map uh, uh, patient challenges, just at the click of a button and a data review from the, from the database system. And then also, if you intend to conduct a research, it is made way much easier because from that data, you're able to do good uh, problem assessment. You're good to do uh, guided patient selection because you have all the patients registered in your system, as opposed to looking for them on paper. This one came from here, this one came from there. I can have a real time cap to the patient address. And then also it makes tracking of patients very, very easy for those prolonged research programs. 
I can keep my patient, keep track of all the contacts from time to time until when they are fit to exit the program, or I can continue them for as long as I still need them in the program, which is credit to the research industry. And then the usage of the application and the program is a bit so easy that uh, even a simple mobile phone device, an Android application, you can easily have it on your phone, you can work anywhere. You don't have to, you know, to have sophisticated gadgets to run the, the software or to run this application. So the usage among the healthcare workers is easy. Even the community people, the, the village health teams, they're also able to, you know, to get onto the platform by uploading the, the application on their mobile phone. So I find it a very, very good innovation. And for the hospital, for the region, it's really making wonders. The community is very positive. The health workers are very positive. And uh, we are really hoping that the transformation is, is just starting, but looking forward to the best out of this partnership. Me as a hospital, as an administrator, I am really glad that CTI really selected Uyuko Hospital. And uh, to mention, starting rural for such an intervention is the best way to go. So I appreciate uh, CTI, Michael, and uh, Michelle for doing this because uh, majority of the population here are very, very poor people who neglect health for survival. They look at feeding and a bit of few life support amenities for them to live. So if this program is removing a lot it is and successful, then it means that you have already hit the target because if the very poor of all can see value for this intervention and can be able to, to, to maximize the opportunity to get themselves functional through minding about their health, minding about the community and their neighbors, to give you credit that in the future, when you move to the urban setting where people can afford the phone, airtime, internet, it will already be a success. So I appreciate the inventors of this program. I, uh, I appreciate you for choosing to start rural because the impact is there. We have worked for a short time, but the impact is there. Thank you very much. Dr. David Wambi, thank you so much for giving us some on the ground perspective. We're really um, beyond honored to be part of the process. And I think that some of the points that you're making are a direct reflection on the need and that we're ready for digital. You know, I know the infrastructure is, is challenging, but at the at the same time, the, the world is ready, patients are ready and institutions are ready. So thank you for giving us some more uh, insight into what's really happening. I would love to um, just speak to the audience for a moment. We do not have the chat box enabled, but we would love to hear your questions. Um, if you go and look at the bottom of your screen, there's a little Q&A box there, and you may even see a little red number one circled because there's a question that's residing in there now, but feel free to push your questions into the Q&A. We'll also open it up to the audience uh, for, for more discussion after another speaker here, but I just wanted to point that out in case people have questions and want to banter there. Michelle and I will moderate that uh, in just a little bit. But thank you again, Dr. David. I'd like to um, introduce everybody to Mr. Ron Emerson. Ron is easily one of the most knowledgeable people when it comes to telemedicine and applications on digital health uh, at a global level. Ron's most recent position uh, was the global healthcare lead at Zoom Video Communications. And I would love to um, turn it over to him now. Ron, please take the stage. Nah, thank you very much, and um, um, and and thank you, Michael, and 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 Dr. David, and um, Dr. Narenda for um, wonderful presentations. And it's really an honor to be here. Um, just a little bit about my background. Uh, as Michelle had said, I uh, um, up to about three weeks ago was the global healthcare lead at Zoom, where I had a I think a very unique opportunity to meet with uh, organizations from all around the world. Um, Zoom actually works with seven out of the top. 10 pharmaceutical companies in the world. Um, we work with organizations. We work with organizations like Viva, um, who um, provide technology for clinical research organizations. And then Zoom also is the telemedicine solution of choice, the video integrated in through electronic medical records and, and, and solutions like CTI. Um, 
uh, in nine out of the top 10 hospitals in the world, if you look at the top 10 rated hospitals, like, like um, you know, Mayo Clinic and Johns Hopkins and those as well. And um, I, I'm really proud to say, you know, when I, when I look at the CTI solution, uh, after having done telehealth for 20 years, it really is one of the most outstanding solutions out there. And what's so good about it is that organizations um, um, globally are really looking for multi-purpose solutions um, that they can use for a variety of uses, right? One, of course, I think, you know, Dr. David did a wonderful job and um, Dr. Narenda about, you know, just data, but, you know, we can have data, but then how do we react to that data in an efficient way, regardless of where people are located? And the whole concept of telehealth is when is it more efficient to move information than that it is to actually um, to move people, right? And we can reach people where they're at sort of across that, that continuum of care. So first of all, just talking about uh, the, the clinical research piece of this, which is what we focused on um, originally in, in uh, um, Dr. Narenda, I, I, I love the overview you gave. And um, I was honored to, about three months ago, I was on a panel at Vive with um, one of the top four executives of Moderna Healthcare. And um, our panel was actually on um, um, equity, um, equity. And, you know, one of the biggest challenges that she brought up, of course, is uh, the underrepresentation of um, the ability to do clinical trials in the continent of Africa was actually one of the things she specifically talked about and how do we reach out and how do we do a better job of having increased representation regardless of where, where people are located. And uh, that's one of the great things about CTI is um, as we digitalize this process, we can get that data and we can we can get the data regardless of where people are looking and that the um, clinical research organizations for the actual drug companies themselves and pharmaceuticals and biomed companies know that they're getting actual digitalized data where they can process the large numbers that they need to in a short amount of time. Um, you know, one of the biggest movements that we're seeing in the uh, um, clinical research area and specifically clinical trials for drugs is, of course, the decentralized trial process. And, you know, traditionally, um, uh, uh, most of you know this, that uh, and, and still in many cases, you know, participants have to live near a clinical trial site, right? They have to live near the hospital system where they're actually doing this. But we realize that model um, isn't, does not provide the appropriate level of representation that we need for people in different areas so we can reach out and decentralize those and then involve those people in those studies regardless of where they're located. Um, the data shows um, that it's still quite small uh, when you look at decentralized trials. Uh, I looked at some data uh, just yesterday preparing for this that about 77% uh, of trials look at some sort of decentralized model with it um, where they're using technology to reach people. And that's just on a hybrid model though, where they still have to be sort of near a site where they can have a hybrid model where some of it's in person, some of it's decentralized. But um, about 80% of organizations, CROs and, and pharmaceutical companies are actually looking at how to decentralize that process in the future as we say, so they can have better representation for clinical research. Um, something I do want to go over, of course, specifically, and uh, there's a, um, I, I think both of the, the doctors and Michael did a phenomenal job of talking about the data and, as I say, the, the multi-purpose use of the platform, but I want to talk some about telemedicine and, and the opportunity that it provides um, just from a global perspective. Um, I had an opportunity to meet with, you know, sometimes four to six different countries a week as a head of healthcare at, at Zoom, and um, just some really interesting data points. You know, if you look at before COVID, um, less than 3% of people who could actually see a doctor, let's say over their phone, would actually do it. And that was if it was actually paid for. We just weren't used to the technology and people wouldn't make that jump. Since COVID has um, kicked in, um, hospitals around the world, we saw up to 90% of all visits being done. And what we see now is globally, if you look at all the different countries and numbers, um, you know, around anywhere between eight to 20% of all outpatient visits are being done virtually um, over telehealth because of that transfer of COVID. And that's why CTI provides such an amazing tool. So what does telemedicine provide for us? Um, the first thing is when we look at healthcare, what are we all here for? And, you know, um, um, Dr. David did a great job of talking about his hospital and, and patients and the representation and, and you know the um, you know we're working with folks that are poverty and it's very hard for them access of course is one of the biggest issues um, 
we're there to take care of the patient. And the question is, do patients like it? Um, you know, the tools that CTI has built in, we do know that um, at Zoom, Zoom sponsored a study globally, and they looked at a number of countries across the world. And people that had actually had a telemedicine visit, and, and this is without medical devices, this is if someone on their phone, um, within six months, they had a, a visit, basically that uh, about 63% of people uh, said that they wanted a hybrid model of care. So it's not just one or the other. And that's one of the great things about this tool, CTI, is it has the foundational components of what you need within an inpatient, um, inpatient facility within the actual physical location itself. But then as Dr. David um, articulated, it allows them to follow and reach out into the community, but actually keep contact with those patients and still have clinical interactions over telemedicine. So patients like telemedicine, we've proven that time and time again. Um, the next thing that of course, uh, clinicians and all of us are interested in is what kind of care can we provide? Clinical efficacy. So if um, Dr. David sees me in person, um, and then I walk out of the room and um, and I and 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 I walk into another room and I see a patient over video, depending on the specialty, you know, we realize that the diagnosis basically can be pretty much exactly the same. Um, mental health is a case where it's almost exactly the same in most cases. When you look at other specialties. Uh, Mayo Clinic just did a study where they found, um, they looked at 2,400 patients just using basically a video call, same technology, it was Zoom, so same technology that Michael's using, uh, Mayo Clinic is using as far as the, 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 the video quality goes. And what they found is that regardless of the specialty, regardless, um, it was a double blind study, 87% of the time the diagnosis was exactly the same. And that's without medical peripheral devices. That's just basically someone on their phone actually talking. So the diagnostic capability is there. Now, some of the models we're seeing in, in, in developing countries is um, where we have internet problems, we don't have a lot of people with, with, with uh, um, phones, is how do we um, allow uh, doctors that are in central locations, right? We just don't, you know, as Dr. David said, we just don't have enough providers but they're, um, um, we have a male distribution of them in the larger urban centers, right? So how do we reach people where they're at and overcome that barrier? And there's really two models we've seen developed. And these are things that CTI can do is, one of course is we can um, um, just use what we call direct to consumer, which is where someone's on their phone, we have internet, it works. Um, another model that is grown and I've seen a lot in Central and South, in, in South America in some very rural villages is where you know we have a nurse um, in a rural area where we know we have connectivity to a certain clinic, and then we have providers basically just do outreach to those different, and they have a formula over there, so they have medicine, and the nurse is there. The nurse has medical peripheral devices and otoscope to look at an ear, look in the throat, um, dermoscopes look at skin conditions, and they have the basic formulary that people need for urgent conditions, right? They don't have all of the long-term things, but somebody comes in for urgent care, they can get the care they need. Um, I saw a question about women's health. Um, um, down in Bolivia, one of the projects that was really focused on was women's health and, 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 and decreasing um, infant mortality, right? And they were doing ultrasound, um, level two ultrasounds actually to provide feedback um, so that they could catch specific conditions. And there's been some really good outcomes from that. So how do we extend the arm of the provider and reach people where they're at? And those are the two types of telemedicine. But even with this, Kaiser did a study and what they showed is that just even over a basic video call, over a basic Zoom call like we're on today, that um, for urgent care, which means you don't know what you're gonna get. You take every call that comes in they felt comfortable that they could diagnose um, about 70% uh, about of the time, and they do 65,000 of these every day, 65,000 telemedicine consults a day, that 70% of the time they could actually provide the, the care um, that is actually needed. And then the last thing I'm going to talk about, of course, which is top of mind for all of us and we all struggle with is we always think of the patient, of course. We always think of what kind of care can we provide. And CTI has done an amazing job at, at, at you know, the integration of the data with the ability to react in the data and see patients where they're located um, with telemedicine applications. But a lot of it comes down to return and investment, right? And how can we justify the cost of these solutions? Um, you know, in, in public systems, right? Public systems um, that we want to decrease cost 
and we want to increase efficiencies and increase access to people that need it because all citizens of every country deserves the basic right of healthcare, right? And then private systems, of course, want to look at how they can use the technology to reach out and sometimes often capture more patients um, because it's a competitive market in the private healthcare market. And they want those people to come to their facility rather than go to maybe another private hospital on the other side. But one of the um, just really strong things, uh, one of the strong points of CTI um, when I uh, first looked at the solution is, um, as, the, as the very recently head of healthcare at Zoom, was this the, modula, the modularity of the actual platform itself? Um, they've done a very good job where it has many of the tools that you need on a day-to-day -day basis to capture data um, in the inpatient setting so that when you're seeing patients in person, you can see them and you can use it for clinical research as, um, um, as Dr. Um, Narenda is very interested in. You can use it for those sort of data points and that's what Michael showed. But then using that same platform, when you're not looking at clinical research, you can use it for just everyday utilization within your system for data, but then also for telemedicine to reach out and provide that care um, at a distance. And that's what organizations are looking for is that multi-purpose use to decrease costs and sustainability. So um, I just want to thank everyone for your time. Um, it's been a real pleasure. And I, I hope I sh um, shed a little light, not just on CTI, but what we're seeing from a global perspective as far as clinical research and, and how telehealth and telemedicine is being used and the impact that, it, that it's having. So thank you very much. And thank you, Michelle. And, and thank you, Michael. And um, to both the good doctors, I appreciate it. Mm, thank you so much, Ron. That was a wonderful presentation, very insightful. And I think that global perspective is important as we're thinking about what's working in other rural environments and how that might apply to what's happening in Africa. Some good examples and also some, um, some very pragmatic uh, recommendations there as well. Uh, that is the last speaker um, that we've got in our panelist session. So I would love to turn the session over now to Michelle uh, at EDCTP, the other Michelle, and she can take it away. Thank you, Michelle. Um, thank you to all the presenters for such um, rich presentations and insight into how telemedicine can be you know, used in resource-limited uh, settings. So... The floor is now open for questions. Uh, Michelle and I are going to monitor the Q&A box as the questions come in. Um, so we have one question from an anonymous attendee. And I think this question uh, will be directed to Michael. And the question states, medicine will be a great benefit to our communities, especially market women who work very long hours each day. Um, the participant wants to know, is there a recruitment process specifically for market women and others in need of care desperately? Um, I, 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 whoever it is, I thank you for that question because I couldn't have planted a better question myself. Uh, we actually have, uh, have, a, have a collaboration uh, with a group called IST in Uganda, which is 60,000 market women. And we're in the process of actually installing our first uh, tele, you know, kiosk, telemedicine kiosks that we're going to be establishing kind of within the markets. And literally as of yesterday, you know, we had a discussion with MTN that want to sponsor it and want to be our partner to be able to ensure that all the within that world of the 60,000 women in the markets that we'll be able to have uh, to provide the life health solutions and more than just the telemedicine solutions, but actually in the marketplace itself, can be able to start working with the, uh, the the tele the, the the MTN in this particular case, uh, who are uh, as I'm sure all of you are familiar in Africa, but MTN are prevalent all over the all, the, all over the all over Africa, and in any given country in Uganda they have I think 190,000 you know, agents. So and then certainly within the market environment, the idea is to be able to provide you know kind of as close to the source as possible, the 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 richest telemedicine digital healthcare, you know, kind of package that could be available. So, and talking to Ron's point before about the program that he saw in Bolivia, uh, that's actually how Ron and I met even before he was at Zoom, even before Zoom was Zoom almost, right? We we met when we were talking about how do we use technology and how do we use devices that, that can connect in a rural environment where there's no electricity and there are no wires, but you can connect everything via Bluetooth. So the idea of being able to create, create like a, a mini mobile medical clinic 
um, whether it's a clinic in a bag or whether it's going to be in a, uh, um, in a, in a kiosk in the village in the, uh, in the, for the market women. So we are, we're, we're on it. We're on it. We've already got our first 60,000 women that we're, we're collaborating with. It's a, it's a uh, called IST in Uganda. It's somehow related to the Catholic um, operation over there, to the Caritas. And, uh, and any good ideas or any sponsorship for these people, for these women or collaborations in other places, we, we welcome. Thank you. You know, just to add on that, um, um, Mike, on the, and that is a very good question. I mean, you know, one of the models I've seen I've even, in the U.S., I, uh, if, if folks wonder where we're located, I'm actually uh, in the northeastern United States right now um, near Boston. If you look at Boston, there's a state north of Boston. It's called Maine, um, which is where I've been for like, I was like for 24 years, I just moved to, to near Boston. But um, that same model that you would ask the, the whoever the, 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 the um, um, gentleman or, or ma'am, whoever asked the question, um, that same model is actually being done in the US. And a lot of it is in the state of Maine, we have rural areas where uh, they have, um, um, we have workers that come in from different countries, Central and South America, um, and they pick uh, they a lot of them pick blueberries and and it's a it's a big market over here and they're very rural areas they're out there they work very long hours and one of the projects I was involved with I didn't tell you with um, early in my career this is going back about 23 years 24 years um, not to age myself uh, but um, we actually had set up a mobile clinic where we had a van and what we would do is we had it outfitted with telemedicine technology and it would go to the different areas. Uh, it would go to the different areas each day where these workers were, and we would stop. We would spend two hours at one. We would go from that facility. We would go to the next one, drive right, because it's easier to move that, that move the technology than it is, of course, the workers. And and the reality is, and and whoever asked that question is what we see a lot of times is people work long hours and very hard and they can't leave. Is that um, you know the benefits also to the employer. So a lot of times we can start to get employers. To look at how they can um, invest in their own workers so that they're not missing work so that they're more productive when they're there and um, I know it seems like a selfish reason but but that is one of the reasons that we had a lot of these employers that would sponsor these type of things because it benefits them as well so that they have productive workers and and, and, it, and it, of course it provides the, the access that's needed so that's a very um, that's not a hard model to pull off that's being done today um, and, and specifically for women and for men, but, but it's being pulled off today. So just to give you a, an actual real life example of, of what you just said, and CTI definitely has everything that's needed um, to accomplish um, that specific use case, so. Thank you, Ron. Thank you, Michael. And I hope uh, that uh, the participant um, is um, happy and satisfied with the responses. So Michael, I think this is another one for you um, because you, you mentioned data ownership. Um, but there's a question from Anne Goomba on how do you ensure data security? I'm just going to share my screen for a moment because I don't, I can be rattling off lots of words and not being technical. I wouldn't really know what they mean. Uh, but we, we've always ensured, we, our platform currently is a combination of IBM and, uh, and with uh, AWS. So our team are constantly working with AWS to ensure that we're at the highest levels of data security, but we're actually partnering now with a company called MedStack, and MedStack is the world leader in, in uh, protecting medical data. And so this is their, their screen, you know, kind of how they do third-party verified and uh, two-factor authentications and firewalls and, and all of that. So we, we've actually, we're, 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 make sure that we are at the highest level of security. We recognize that we're dealing with some of the most sensitive information that, that exists out there, which is people's medical records. And um, so that's it. So we're working with MedStack and we're ensuring that we have our, um, the, best, the best data security that's available out there. That's the best, I best we could do. I'm, I'm sorry, go ahead, sir, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, Ron, if you've got anything extra to no, add. I'm just going to add about the telemedicine piece. That's where, I'll, you know, the, so you've just covered the data at rest and, and the data, but when telemedicine is being provided with the partnership with Zoom, um, Zoom also uses AWS, Amazon Web Services. And when data is at rest, the data is protected by 256-bit AES encryption. And when the data is in motion for an actual live telemedicine visit or like a call we're on right now, it's also protected by AES 256-bit um, encryption and it meets all of the um, U.S. standards for 
for HIPAA, SOC 2, um, um, type 2, and all the other things that would be necessary. So very well covered on, um, on all fronts from a, a security perspective and privacy perspective. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, I have a question for Dr. David. And Dr. David, thank you for your um, presentation or testimonial on the impact and the benefit of using this um, tool within, um, you know, uh, your, your your hospital. So you you indicated that you know it's it's the uptake has been great and um, it's been a very useful tool uh, for your community. But I was just wondering, in rolling out the tool, what what challenges did you face? It would be interesting to know what went into rolling out the tool and what barriers there were. Well, I don't see Dr. David here anymore, so I'll I'll take that one also, just because uh, Dr. David's not here. Um, but th this is an ongoing process for us. So what we've done with him is identified some of the village health teams uh, that they've got that are associated and affiliated with their hospital. We gave them tablets. We're training them how to use the tablets because uh, a lot of these people aren't that sophisticated. They haven't had the experience of using technology. So we're training them. We're training them how to go into the patient's home, how to collect the data, how to be able to kind of help a patient sign onto their own, onto their own wallet, how to go and do a telemedicine call. This is an ongoing process. This is an ongoing, constant learning process. So this isn't a one and done. This is, you know, so, and, and that's what we're very focused on, of how do we ensure that all of these, if all of these systems work and in a, in a rural environment, it's going to be much easier for us once we start going into the cities because people are more technical savvy. But, you know, as Frank Sinatra said about if you can make it in New York, you can make it anywhere. Well, when it comes to these sort of things, if you can make it in Bawikwe in rural Africa, you can make it work anywhere. And so we're, we're taking the little bit, the, the opposite of the New York model uh, to prove it. But it, it's a constant, it's a constant learning experience. As, as I showed you before with the cartoons, so we're creating now special comic strips and cartoons to be able to train the health workers, how they can do, what they can do. Um, and I think I see Dr. David has, has just joined again now, but I think, that, I think that gives you the answer to that question. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Michael. Um, so we'll move on to the next question. This is from Louis Nguyai, and um, I'm not sure who's going to respond to this, but um, the question reads, can you elaborate how CTI gets its return on investment in Uganda? Has the business model demonstrated sustainability, and can it be replicated across um, initially in Africa and beyond? Yes, yeah, so again, I think I'll just, I'll just take that again. I mean, I, we're, we're not going to, this is not the forum this is not an investor panel, so we're not. It's not the forum to tell you exactly what our business model is, or, or isn't. But we are, uh, as you can see, it's a very robust platform. Um, our goals are to be able to create this, uh, to be able to be a universal healthcare platform, so that countries can go and deploy this, so that every citizen in the country can get access to world class medicine. And this is a solution that we can deploy very, very quickly, and it'll be a game changer for any country that joins our platform. And uh, and works and works with us, and and then it's a negotiation with each particular country to see, you know, kind of how, how much how much can we make, you know, kind of how much is the country going to pay us, how much will the people pay to be able to do their telemedicine calls, you know, kind of when where people are ordering their prescriptions through because now they're aware that they need um, a prescription for hypertension or something. So we've got lots of ways of being able to develop uh, financial models. Our focus is not. How can we make tons of money? Our focus is how can we provide a great service and make a little bit of money, enough money, but um, do it on scale so that we can go and ensure that we've got a sustainable platform. So everything that we've seen so far kind of indicates that it's going to be it's going to be really good. Michael, just to just to add on to that, I think you know one of the one of the really interesting things that we're we're seeing globally and that you know, CTI can provide is when you look at public systems, as we look at sustainability and, and the return on investment and how um, public systems can actually sustain um, um, sustain the technology, um, there, there's, there's really two models to it. One is from a public perspective. Let's talk about that first. Of course, you know, anytime we can digitalize and streamline processes from a data perspective, we, um, um, with AI and everything in the back end, we can streamline processes and that's why electronic medical records have been so big and of course a lot of the tools are, are here as well and as we move away from paper we increase efficiencies we can find data we can track it's quicker it's faster all the things i think that we all realize as we use our computers every day 
instead of just writing things down, right? All the different tools. Um, um, that's one piece of it. But you know, one of the um, from a public perspective, one of the biggest tools is um, in the ROI and sustainability for public systems. And as the, as, as as part of the question, I think that they're getting at um, the question I was getting at is is um, is what we find is there is definitely a correlation between and I'm talking, I'm going kind of down the telemedicine route again, um, the on-premise, as I just talked about, the, the digitalization of health information technology is very big. Um, so, so uh, um, the, the, the data and streamlining of the data on-premise for everyday operational use is big, right? But then when these systems need to use telemedicine and virtualize that, there's a correlation between access to care and quality to care. And if you're in a public healthcare system, depending on where you're at, we do know that if we can reach people and we can provide telemedicine and we can reach out to them quickly, we decrease the chances of an exacerbation, right? So that they don't become more sick and they don't need more expensive resources within the health system. Um, they do not need to go to the hospital. Um, um, and I know in many cases, I've, I've been to, to a number of countries in Africa, um, um, Western Africa, and, and I've, I've been to um, Southern Africa, um, you know, as, as I think the good doctor, um, Dr. David said, um, was that, you know, we, we, we have people who are so focused just on everyday um, um, survival for, for, for life that sometimes their health isn't a priority. But when even urgent care, if we know if we reach those people, then they don't get so sick that we can help treat them where it's more preventative, where they don't end up coming to the hospital when they are very, very sick and it decreases costs. There's been a number of studies in public systems, more from developed countries, but um, that's it. And, and I'll just give one example. Um, the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center, um, they are in the United States, everybody knows the US is private, but some hospitals are insurance companies and they're also providers. So they have doctors, like, like the good doctors on the call here. So they have like doctors like Dr. David who provide care but then they also pay the bill just like a public healthcare system does, right? And, and what they found is that by using telemedicine for urgent care, this is just to reach out. So let's just take you down as an example. If you reach out and provide care to a patient over telemedicine so that the patient's condition does not deteriorate where they need more expensive forms of care, where they end up in urgent care centers or they end up in Dr. David's office using resources of his staff and all the other areas, or they end up in the hospital because they're so sick, sick what they found is that, and this is in US dollars, so I apologize the, the, the high number here because it's so, um, it is a, um, they saved a hundred, $123 per patient when they use telemedicine. And what they did is they actually tracked it over a three month period. So they would see the patient, like Dr. David would see a patient over telemedicine, and then they tracked that patient for three months to make sure that it was a durable treatment. Because if Dr. David saw him over telemedicine or her, and then the patient was in the hospital the next day in the emergency room or sick, then it wasn't an effective treatment, right? So what that showed is that this virtual technology actually can have an impact. And that's where a lot of organizations get the ROI is how do we fend off and, and use it? The other question is ROI. And I know I'm going on a long time, but I think it's such a big, it's such an important topic for what CTI provides in telemedicine is that people ask, well, is it more efficient? You know, we talked to um, um, Dr. Dave, not to keep picking on you, sir, and, and mentioned in what you said, but you had some great comments about we, the, the number of doctors to patients, just huge, right? Um, telemedicine is actually proven to use less time to see a patient than actually in-person um, visits. The average um, in-person visit, and this is from the US, so I apologize, but that's the data I have, is between 13 to 14 minutes. Um, the average telemedicine visit can be seven to eight minutes because a lot of the formalities sort of go away. It's more about what are you here for? What are you doing? Okay, this, this, and this, and then boom, they're out the door. They're not moving room to room. They're just seeing patients. So um, those are some of the ways that we see organizations doing ROI. Now, if you're a private system, if the person asks that's from a private healthcare system, um, I'll be honest with you. It's if I'm a hospital and Michelle's a hospital and I provide telemedicine and make it easier for you to access services, um, I'm going to retain you. You might come to my facility and you might get your MRI, your CAT scan, your blood work, and that's revenue to my hospital and not to Michelle's hospital because I make it easier for you to receive services and I'm providing a better service. So it's the business case of telemedicine of why organizations are pushing um, um, being in the US, which is, of course, the biggest, biggest private healthcare sector in the world. So 
I hope that covers your uh, long answer, but I hope that covers your your question of the importance of the technology. Thank you, Ron. Um, Michael, anything else to add or? No, again, this, you know, I, just don't tempt me. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, I can just go on and on, right? So okay. let's, 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 let's target, let's to target the, the questions. All right, sure. So the next question is from Paxton Morira, and again, praise on what an impressive tool you've showcased. And I believe we haven't even begun scratching the potential of, of, of this platform. Um, but he would like to know whether there's been any engagement with industry partners and PDPs, and, well, and if so, how that is going. Well, I think part of my answer is that I don't know what a PDP is, so that may answer the question. All right, so, um, but we're, you know, I'm, I'm waiting for Caxton to, uh, to, to set us on the right path and introduce us to all the right people. You know, we've, uh, we're, we're, so we're still a reason, we're still a new company. Um, we've built, our focus has been building technology and building it in a way that is usable and user-friendly and that it works. Our focus has not yet been to, you know, start marketing and marketing and, you know, kind of, we're not driven, you know, we're not, we have no, public funding, we have no private equity, venture capital funding in the company. So we're up, we don't have a pressure to produce results on a day-to-day -day basis. Our pressure is to make sure that we deliver a phenomenal solution, a phenomenal platform. And, and now that, you know, thanks to Dr. Tom, uh, we've, give, we've been given this platform, hopefully after this session, many of you are gonna start reaching out to us and say, okay, how can we get something started? How can we work together? How can we get, you know, kind of our pharmacovigilance program going on with you with the existing drugs? How can we, and we've got a partnership with companies that we, so we've, you know, and, and every element, we haven't even discussed things like the, on the pharmacovigilance, we've got solutions that we are integrating to be able to do drug, drug adversity testing. And because we can, we'll, we'll now be able to, to track the drugs of a particular drug company, a pharmaceutical company wants to see what's the efficacy of their drug. Well, we can now, you give us the drug, we'll identify who's taking the drug. We can direct company, direct hospitals to try and prescribe your drug more and let's follow it, right? And we've got the ability to do that now, which we didn't have even three months ago, but today we do. And today we don't have the ability to do it in 15 countries, but in a month, you know, depending on our collaborations with you, we will. Right? We're moving very quickly. There are several people on the call over here who have, we've been in discussions with, you know, kind of for a year or even more than a year. And they see at the pace at which we're moving. We're moving very quickly because our focus has been delivering an incredible product. We've not been distracted by, okay, we need to make money and need to make money. And then we start making bad decisions. We've been very focused on creating an incredible platform. So we are open to industry partners and hopefully PDPs are a good thing. And so we're looking to welcome discussions and partnerships with PDPs and Caxton. We're looking for you to be you know, at the forefront of our collaborations. Thanks, Michael. So PDPs are product development partners and uh, Caxton, I guess the ball is in your court now. Um, the next uh, question is from Charles Namugera and uh, he asks, what is the cost of being enrolled to the program and can people in rural settings sustain the costs? Yeah, so as I said, we, we've not we've not focused on a price point per se. You know, right now we're enrolling people for free into the platform, and as we evolve the platform, you know, our vision uh, that we've discussed with several governments and countries is that this becomes part of the national health insurance platform. So this is something that the, the governments are collecting money anyway to offer universal health care in their countries. It's debatable whether they're offering good services, not good services, but we believe that the life health platform is the basics. It's the starting point and it gives everybody and empowers every person who's on the platform. So we believe that the, the monies that governments are collecting for uh, universal health care in their countries give a little bit to us so that way we can provide people with real medical records, access to telemedicine, access to the local volunt the, the, uh, the village health teams to be able to come and provide services directly. And as far as exactly how much it costs, we're, we're not looking to charge tens of dollars a month. We're looking to charge a dollar, two, three. We're looking, people need some drugs. We'll make sure that we can get even better priced drugs to the people because we'll be able to do this on a large scale. And let's keep it, uh, but let's just make a little click, a little click along the way. So our long-term business model is to make 
good money. We're a business. We're not a, we're not a philanthropy. We're not a charity. But we want to make good business by being able to engage many, many more people, onboard many more people onto the healthcare system. And we just make a little bit of money on each person each time they do a transaction. So, uh, so we believe that our system will actually kind of massively reduce the cost of healthcare, massively increase the quality and efficiency of healthcare. It'll massively reduce the cost for health infrastructures, for governments on a long-term and on a short-term basis. And we'll find the ways within that efficiency for us to do okay as a business so that we can keep growing and expanding this to hopefully all the developing countries in the world. Thanks, thank you, Michael. Um, the last question. Um, again, praise on uh, what an excellent tool you showcased. And I think this is uh, this question is touching on, you know, creating awareness from the ground up. And uh, the question um, states, are you, are you able to involve universities and training institutions to incorporate telehealth in the medical curriculum? Please let us know. Let me, let me pass that over to Michelle, because we've, we've been having loads of discussions with, with international, with, uh, with the universities, and, and that's like our, our greatest uh, desire and wish. So let me pass that over to Michelle, and I thank you all. I'm assuming this is my goodbye to all of you, and uh, welcome. You'll, it's easy to reach us, and we're, we're looking forward to engaging with all of you in the, in the near future. So over to Michelle. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Michael. Absolutely. <laughs> we would love to be partnering with institutions and, and research uh, teams. And as far as creating curriculum, um, you know, our team has a, a rather academic focus in that we are interested in creating new systems and we're interested in creating new ways of doing things, um, not only in terms of thought processes and uh, things that might shift behavior, but understanding um, what some of those uh, touch points would be in terms of education. And I think that, you know, as we start thinking about everything from digital literacy to uh, linguistics, to symbolism, different kinds of ways that we can communicate as we get into some of the more complex areas and topics like language barriers or digital use barriers. There's a number of different, um, even early, you know, phase one, stage one areas that we need to start developing content around and working through ways to uh, create educational tools and training systems to train the trainers. So we would love partners in that effort. And if you um, are interested, by all means, contact CTI. We'll make sure, uh, I'm not sure where to post it since our chat's disabled, but I will put it maybe here in the Q&A box. I'll send our contact information, or you can go to our website, which is C-T-I-A-F-R-I-C-A, C-T-I-Africa.com. And uh, you can contact us through there as well to, to try and set something up. Thank you, It'd be wonderful. Thank you, Ms. Um, I'm just monitoring the participants list and I'm not seeing any hands up. Um, no one's raised their hand, so I'm assuming there are no more questions. So I will hand over to Tom to give his closing remarks and uh, probably wrap up the meeting. Oh, well, thanks very much everyone. And thank you all the contributors and the audience. I think this has been a very, interesting discussion and as i said in the beginning we have so many gaps and if we are going to make africa a strong force of fighting uh, uh, epidemics and infections and all the other diseases it will need a lot of focus on those deficiencies and definitely the data issue is one of the biggest in 2018, it was just like mere an academic exercise. When we started hearing about the outcomes of workshops that are looking at how to reduce clinical trial costs, and they came up with um, these discussions of what they call virtual clinical trials, or decentralized. There were so many terms they used, decentralized or remote site agonistic trials. It was like an academic exercise and boom, 2020 COVID hit us. And I can tell you, EDCTP has not recovered from it yet. Michelle and colleagues in the operations team, we are still discussing with member states in EDCTP how to rescue 
clinical trials that were completely disrupted because of lockdowns. And now you talk about telemedicine, that's really the tail end when the product is already there. But how do you apply that in clinical research? I think that's also the major question that still remains. So when we talk about telemedicine, now we could also talk about listening from what we have presented here and the questions that have come and discussions, we could also be talking about bringing back the idea of virtual clinical trials, because that will also reduce the costs indeed, because that was the idea of introducing virtual clinical trials to reduce trial costs and also help patients with mobility problems that can, you know, they can ably participate in a trial, but they can travel and then you can monitor them from a, a remote process, a, a remote a, a, a setting. But if another epidemic comes and we are not prepared on how we follow our patients that are already recruited in trials, then we will suffer the same consequence that we had. And we have, all have not learned anything from the epidemic. And we will soon, for example, in EDCTP, hear a call being launched for people to compete for grants to complete projects that were disrupted by COVID. But having been in the industry for some time now, restarting a protocol, a clinical trial protocol that has been deviated upon or violated, it's, it's even more difficult than just continuing the work with the technology you have in a different way. That's my view. And that's why for me, I really support this discussion. And I hope this is not the end. And this discussion will continue to help us have more knowledge on how we can address these areas in Africa as the, the battle continues of, you know, uh, these diseases are coming to us around you know, from every angle of, uh, of Africa. We are in Africa a little bit disadvantaged more than other nations because of big heterogeneity that we have among ourselves. So we admire the European Union where people are a little bit uniform, but when you talk to them, they say, no, we are not the same yet. And then Brexit makes it more complicated. That's fine, you know, to, the, to us it's like, no, but we are in deeper problems because the capacity you have in Gabon, I've seen Dr. Alabi is here on the call. Uh, he is from uh, Lambarine in Gabon. And then there's uh, Dr. Saudi from Mozambique is here. The differences you get between trial sites in Chad, Sudan, Gabon, Guinea-Bissau, Kenya, South Africa, it's just enormous. And the question is, how then can we make this an army that fights with the same principles? Uh, it's like a general going to a war with a mixture of uh, um, soldiers that some are legions, some are volunteers, and others are the, the SEALs who have been trained to the highest level. How do you lead this kind of uh, uh, you know, combo of soldiers? into a better war. This is the situation we have here in Africa. And I think for so many Africans who are in, the, in this call, they would probably agree with my analysis and the, the problem is not as simple as it is seen from US, Europe, or in Asia. And as I said before, I'm really honored to be on this global committee now of WHO, where we can learn also from different areas and see what can work in Africa. But for today, let me thank you very much, Michael, uh, Michelle, and uh, our Michelle from EDCTP, and all the speakers and all the audience. Thank you very much for starting this dialogue and let's continue to engage. And wherever we can help from EDCTP, you know who the contact person is, is Michelle. And yeah, we'll hear from you. So if there is no any other question from anybody, allow me to close the meeting and wish you a good morning, a good afternoon, or a good evening, depending on, on where you are. Thank you very much.